Thirty fold. Thirty fold. And you are the ambassador of that world. You carry it. The way it is given to you, you deliver it. In your districts, in your locations. You can't turn it down. You can't tone it down. You can't prune it down. Ask the Lord that God will help you to be faithful. Faithful. And as you are learning, you are getting it. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are just praying on that word today. In James chapter 1, we are praying on that word. James chapter 1, verse 22. The Bible says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Be ye doers. The grace to do. Listen, a lot of people can hear. People do hear. But do they do? Ask the Lord that God will give you grace to be doers of the word. You are going to hear it again. You are going to hear it again. Let that word have a place in your heart, in your life, in your home, in your district church, your location churches. Ask the Lord. It's not as if one is pouring water on the back of the dock. You are hearing it. It's bringing forth fruit. You want to see the fruit in your life. Pray, you will see the fruit of this word of God in your life, in your heart, in your soul. In Jesus' name, we pray. Now that the heart is prepared, you are going to pray for our Father in the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. The Bible here says, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Mystery of the gospel. You are going to pray, Lord, for your servants, our own Father in the Lord, let the anointing, fresh one, let it come upon him tonight, that the mystery of the gospel will be made known unto the church of Christ. Open your mouth and pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Our Father, we thank you for tonight. We bless and praise your name for what you have been doing in the church. Speaking to us, and we have made our commitment to obey your word. We pray, Lord, that this night you will speak through our Father and the Lord, your servant, that we will hear the word and we will be eager to be obedient to the word in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you because you have answered us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Praise the Lord. Headquarters, I said, praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this Saturday workers' meeting. Thank you for the teaching, the training. Thank you for the exposure to the word of God. We're asking, Lord, your word will find real, central, conspicuous place in every heart in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, your word 
will be fresh to everyone. And you help us to have real understanding of what you are revealing to us even today in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone. As we come to talk about an important subject in the Bible, in the doctrines of the Bible, and in the Word of God at large, we need to open our minds properly so that we hear what the Lord is saying. The central word is the word tribulation. Tribulation. And because of what the Lord has revealed on the great tribulation, which is actually a future tribulation, many people have forgotten the past tribulation, the present tribulation, and they concentrate on the future tribulation. There is a present tribulation, the same Jesus that spoke about the great tribulation, also spoke about the tribulation of this time. And the same apostles that spoke about the coming future tribulation, also spoke about the present tribulation. And many people, because they forget there is, there was a past tribulation, and there is a present tribulation, and there is a future tribulation, they concentrate only on the future. The problem there is that their own tribulation comes to them, their own trials, their own troubles. They're not able to know that this is a present tribulation that they need grace to overcome. They need the power of God to overcome and they need vigilance to overcome. Now, about the Antichrist, the same John that God used in revealing to us the character and the characteristics and the wrath of the Antichrist in the coming day, that's the future, the same John said, you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. He said, even now, in the present time, are there many Antichrists. Same John that said, there's the spirit of the Antichrist. And so, if we only push everything to the future after the rapture, that the great tribulation, but before the rapture, there is the general tribulation that people go through. And if you don't put your mind there, you might not understand that there is a present time, a present period of general, not the great tribulation, general tribulation. And we prepare our mind, and whatever is happening, we have the grace and the strength to endure Unto the end. Let me read Matthew chapter 24. And we're looking at verse 21. It says, For then, this future now, future, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It's the peak. Of all the tribulations that ever happened is the most intense and the most traumatizing and the most painful of the tribulations that ever happened. But there had been a tribulation in the past, the tribulation even in the present. It says in verse 22, in verse 22, and except those days shall be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. The pain, the plague, the intensity of the trouble at that time of the tribulation will be so great that except the days were shortened, except the period was limited to seven years, the three and a half years and the latter part being more intense, except for the shortening of the period, except for the uh, brief uh, period, it says no flesh shall be saved, but for the elect's sake, 
for the Jews' sake, for the Israelites' sake, those days shall be shortened. I come into Luke chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 25. In Luke chapter 21, verse 25, it says, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars in the tribulation the people have today i'm sure you, you remember that every uh, gck event we pray for christians under persecution and christians who are suffering real ter terrible suffering and it's a form of tribulation it happens in many pockets of societies that they do not happen everywhere at present, but it's so intense and it's so difficult for the people. Some actually even lose their lives in the present trial, in the present trouble, in the present tribulation. But it's the great tribulation that will attract the signs in the sun and the signs in the moon, and the signs in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations. You know, in entering into that period of the great tribulation, there will be distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring, tells us in verse 26, it says, and men's hearts failing them people having cardiac arrest and having the failure of the heart that the heart will not sustain them and they see what is happening and they become afraid of what is happening and as they become totally fragmented in their heart because of the events happening that's why it says men's heart will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth and the powers for the powers of heaven shall be shaken the stars the moon and all the galaxies of the in the sky in the great beyond everything shaking now it tells us in verse 32, in verse 32, it says, Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. That is the generation that sees all those things happening, they should know the end was about to come. Verse 33, in verse 33, heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away verse 34 in verse 34 and take it to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that they come upon you unawares those are the words of jesus that we should be so careful and so vigilant that we don't concentrate on material things on mundane things that the days will come upon us without being prepared without readiness for start a five it says for his name shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth they don't know about the rapture to come to them suddenly unprepared they don't know about the great tribulation it will come upon them on a west they don't know about the things that will be happening just before the coming of the lord it says because as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth but for the believers verse 36 it says watch ye therefore do you ever watch do you think of the things that are happening now 
Do you watch in order to prepare and get yourself ready? Or is today like yesterday and tomorrow like today and every day like every other day? We learn, we study that these things are coming, yet many people do not even move at all. They don't think. They don't meditate. They don't apply the word to our situation. And they don't get prepared. So they live day to day like they always lived. They think like they always thought. They move like they always move. And they do everything they do like they always did. They forget completely the words of Jesus. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape we pray what do we pray for do we ever bring into our prayer the possibility the reality of escaping the things that are coming on the face of the earth our prayer life yes we pray and pray and pray but we are praying for quite a lot of things and we do not include what Christ instructed us to pray about. Pray ye therefore, he said, and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We're looking at the message, proper response to the teaching on the great tribulation, proper response. How do you respond? How do I respond? How does the church respond? Proper response to the teaching on the great tribulation. Three things we're looking at. Number one, enduring the general tribulations come on to the righteous the righteous there's a tribulation common to everyone any age we're living any generation we're living any time any moment we're living there is the tribulation that is general enduring the general tribulations common to the righteous number two escaping the great tribulation coming after the rapture the saints are supposed to go in the rapture and we go we leave this earth and we go to be with christ in heaven at the time of the rapture and after that the great tribulation will come that's the future tribulation and we live our lives now we depend upon the lord now we ask grace from the lord now so we can escape the great tribulation coming after the rapture number three evangelizing growing transgressors in communities within our reach around us we have people who are transgressing and they're growing in their transgressions because they do not know what is coming they do not know the great revelation that is soon going to come on them and the suffering will be so terrible and so unbearable and so we know they don't know because we know we evangelize these growing transgressors in communities within our reach let's come to number one here number one enduring the general tribulations common to the righteous we're looking at john chapter 16 verse 33 john chapter 16 verse 33 the very words of jesus these things have i spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. The same Christ 
that used the word great tribulation in Matthew chapter 24. That same Christ said, the believers, the children of God, the righteous, it says, in the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Look at three things here. Number one, explaining the tribulation of the righteous, the faithful. Explaining the tribulation that Jesus spoke about that we are going to have in the world and will remain faithful. Number two, enduring the tribulations of the righteous by faith. We have to have faith in the Lord. The faith that saves us keeps us saved. The faith that brought us into, into the kingdom keeps us in the kingdom. The prayer and the faith, the prayer of faith that brought us out of the world and we're now in the kingdom of God and we live by the faith of the Son of God. That same faith is the faith that makes us endure tribulations of the righteous. Number three, evaluating the tribulations of the righteous without fainting when it gets to you, when it gets to me, when it gets to our turn, that the tribulation of the world is now that we evaluate. Isn't this what Jesus said? Isn't this what the early apostles, disciples went through? If Christ went through and if those disciples went through, why should I run away from it? I evaluate and then it keeps you righteous without thinking. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at explaining the tribulation of the righteous the faithful. It tells us in Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. In verse 2, it says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We're justified, we're peace with God, we've turned away from sin, literally, all sins. And deliberately we make up our minds, we block our mind away from all the sins we repented of. And we had faith in Christ, became born again, and now we have the life of Christ in us and the grace of God working in us. And now we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It says in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, and not only so, not only so, but we glory in tribulation. There are tri tribulations today, and we need to understand that, and we need to prepare our minds for that, and it says, but we glory. We rejoice, we take delight, we're delighted in tribulations also, knowing that the tribulation worketh patience. The tribulation that we have today, they teach us patience, they teach us perseverance. The tribulations makes us to remember the world is still the world. The world could be very cruel even today and even before us the world will be very harsh and because we know that we've read it in the bible we now understand that's how the world is and if we're going to practice our faith in this world the harsh world will react the cruel world will react and will rejoice that we're finding that the Bible is true. It happened to other people, Joseph, it happened to him, even the whole of Israel in the land of Egypt, it happened to them. And 
all the people we can think about, the prophets of old, it happened to them, and we rejoice in the fact that we are numbered with them. And tribulation does not take us by surprise. And it works as the bearance and patience and the grace of God more in our lives. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, and patience, experience, and experience hope. Then in verse 5, it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Acts chapter 14, reading from verse 21. In Acts chapter 14, reading from verse 21, it says, And when they had preached the gospel, the good news, the message of salvation to that city, and had taught many, many people, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium and Antioch. Look at verse 22. And they were now confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Continue in the faith. Getting saved and backsliding will not get anyone into heaven. And so they, cons they consecration. The commitment, the perseverance that is needed is that as we live our Christian lives, we need to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, this is not the great tribulation, but much tribulation, this is not the great tribulation, but in the present day tribulation, through much tribulation, we enter into the kingdom of God through much tribulation. And so we need to understand we're not concerned really about the tribulation which is to come. We will not be here. Where our focus is how we can endure, how we can overcome, how we can pass our own test in our own time of examination how we can endure the much tribulation that is coming on us for the present time, the faith we need, the power we need, the strength we need, and the ability to be able to endure whatever is coming upon us today. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading here from verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Look at verse 11. Persecutions and afflictions which came upon me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. That's the tribulation of the believer in the present day. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. He'll deliver you. That's if you know there's the persecution of the righteous, there's the tribulation of the righteous, and you're not complaining, and you're not criticizing, and you're not fighting anybody, and you know, this is what Jesus said will come. And so, what should I complain? This is what Jesus said will come. Why should I fight anybody? Why should I blame anybody? Why don't I just remember the word of the Lord that Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulation, that the scripture says that to enter into the kingdom of God, you'll have much tribulation. And when those tribulations and persecutions come to sit back and to think through on what was happening and then to pray and the Lord will deliver you. But the Lord, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, Yea, 
and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That the tribulation of the present day shall suffer persecution. Then verse, uh, verse 13 says, In verse 13 we're told, But evil men as seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, But continue thou. Persecution, but continue thou. Tribulation, but continue thou. Hardship, but continue thou. Harshness of the world upon us, upon our lives, it says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them. We're coming to number two. Number two, enduring the tribulations of the righteous by faith. Enduring, enduring, it will come. Hardship, it will come. The harshness and the hatred of the, of the world, it will come. But we endure. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross endured the cross he looked forward to the coronation he looked forward to when he'll become the king of kings and the lord of lords and because he looked forward to the crown he endured the cross and that's what we need to do we look at the example of jesus christ when persecution comes when tribulation comes, when the pressure of the world comes upon us, we look forward, we say, the crown is coming. The coronation time is coming. We say, there can be no crown without the cross. The way of the cross leads to the crown. And because we're looking at the future coronation and we're looking at the future conquest and we're looking at the future crown that's why we stand that's why we're firm that's why we say let the winds blow let the waves come we know that it's not going to be like this forever and we have to pass through this before we get over there looking at the example of jesus looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You know, the shame of being uh, on the cross. Not only that, you understand? He was almost totally naked. They removed his clothes. And they nailed him to the cross. And they showed him to the world. You said you are going to build the temple in three days. Okay, come down now. So that we will see that you are the Christ, the Messiah. But he stayed there. He endured the shame. At that times, the world makes us feel ashamed. At that times, people so deal with us and internally we're almost ashamed of ourselves and some people will say when I get out of this look at the shame they brought upon me and look at how they render me to be like less than a slave they say when they come out of this they're not uh, pursuing uh, the faith anymore that's a tribulation that the present period of tribulation. And we look unto Jesus who endured the cross. He despised the shame. And now, this is what was looking toward. He was looking at what will come. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at verse 3 there. In verse 3 it says, For consider him. 
at your own time of trial, consider him. In your own time of tribulation, consider him. In the time of your suffering, suffering in a way that you shouldn't have suffered like that. They should have looked at your character, at your comportment, at your conduct, and they should not even touch you with that kind of thing. But they do. He says, when that time comes, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. When trials are heaped on you, when tribulations come, when difficult time comes, when the world dribbles you here and there, it's easy to be weary, easy to faint, easy to be discouraged. When you consider, <laughs> look at this, look at this, look at this. She didn't even consider this, and because of that, spare me from all this. If you think like that, you'll be weary, you'll faint, and you will not be able to have the strength, the power that confronts that tribulation. But consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. Look at verse 4. It says, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Sinners are very tough. And when you preach against their sin, you resist. And you have to resist back. When they resist, you persist. If you persist, they resist more. Those who don't want to be born again, those who don't want to be saved, those who don't want restoration from their backsliding, you persist in living against sin. Preaching against sin, standing against sin. They're going to resist. They want their liberty to keep on sinning. They want their liberty to be driving so fast and recklessly to hell. And if you check them and you try to slow them down, stop them, make them think and make them repent and make them get saved, they say, no, we're not here for salvation. We're here to keep on sinning, and they will resist you. But here it comes, you understand, this is part of your tribulation. This is part of your persecution. And if you don't know there's any tribulation today, you only think there's tribulation, the great tribulation in the future. And we're going to escape. If that is what you are thinking about, you will not endure the present tribulation that the sinners have against you. And they keep on resisting you. Eventually they shut you up. Eventually, you'll be weary. Eventually, you'll faint. But if you remember, it's just a brief time. And you have to do your duty. You're a preacher of the word of God. You're telling those people at the house fellowship, this is the way. You are telling them, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. If they resist that, you persist. That's a secret, and that shows you understand uh, you are following after Jesus. That's why it says, He have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. The Lord will help every one of us. The Lord will help you. He'll help us in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and uh, tribulations, that she endure. You see, the, the worthies of old, 
the faithfuls of old, the believers of old, they had persecution and tribulations, but endured. And Paul the Apostle said, we rejoice because of you. You knew that persecutions will come and you stood. You knew that tribulations will come and you are standing. We don't understand most of the Pentecostal churches do not have any understanding that there could be persecution, there could be tribulation. Most of the people that say tribulation, tribulation, I'm escaping, I'm escaping, they do not know there are persecutions and tribulations today. Opposition, resistance, suffering for the believer and for the minister to you and that you stand and that you endure. Look at verse 5, in verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. The kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. The kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Sin, it is a righteous sin with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Oh, they don't know that. The persecutors do not know that God is going to recompense tribulation to them. In verse 7, it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels look at verse 8 in verse 8 their own time of tribulation now will come we would escape in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not god and that obey not the gospel of our lord jesus christ it tells us in verse 9 it says who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, separation from God, from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. In verse 10, look at verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony, a message, a gospel, a good news, a word of grace was believed in that day among you. We're coming to number three here. Number three, evaluating the tribulations of the righteous without fainting. It comes and it doesn't shock you to the point you faint. Those who faint, what happens to them? Naturally, when somebody faints, becomes unconscious, is not conscious or thoughtful about what may be happening around. When a believer faints, he gives up because he cannot think of where he's coming from, where he is now, and where he's going. When a minister when a Christian worker fails, he gives up. He forgets his calling. She forgets her calling. And he forgets the grace that sustains us in the ministry. And just gives up. It's like life has come to an end. Courage has come to an end. Strength has come to an end. Ministry has come to an end. And we faint because we don't evaluate what's happening. How do we evaluate? Compare what happens to you with Joseph, the Old Testament. Of that of Isaiah, of that of Jeremiah, 
and with that of Amos, all those prophets, Elijah, Elisha, compare, evaluate what have you gone through that you are fainting. You will not faint. I will not faint. We faint, and then we become surprised. Why? should they do that? Why should I go through this? Why? There's no why. When the scripture have been very clear, and if we only read the scriptures and believe the scriptures, we'll understand that the tribulation of the righteous, the Lord keep you faithful. The Lord keep me faithful. Second, Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have this ministry as apostles, as prophets, as evangelists, as pastors, as teachers of the world. We have this ministry as soul winners, as us fellowship leaders, as singers, as musicians, we have this ministry as disciples, training the disciples, doing follow-up ministry. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. I faint not. I faint not. When something happens to you and you are taken by surprise and you are about getting discouraged, what do you do? Cry? No. Start weeping? No. Asking questions, why should this happen to me? No. What do we do? Go back to the scriptures. You have something. You have received the calling. You have received a ministry. And it says, therefore, seeing that we have obtained well, this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. You are not faint. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not to walk in, in craftiness. When people have trial, and they're not looking at the reason for the trial in their lives, all they want to do is get out of this trial. When people have pressures on them, and, it's become, and they're wondering, why should I have this pressure? All they want to do is get out of it. When people have trials, tribulations, the first thing that occurs to them, out, 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 get out of this. And because of that, they will use some hidden things of dishonesty. Lying will come in. Deception will come in. Just get out, whatever you can do. Whatever you can say, however you can appeal to them, however you can pretend, whatever lies you can tell, tell, tell the lie, so you can escape. Now, when trials come, the first thing is not to get out by all means. When persecution comes, when tribulation comes, the first thing is not to run out you know, by all means, is to stand and to stay well. This trial, this persecution, this pressure, this tribulation, how does it compare with that of Joseph? It's little, it's minor, it's almost negligible in comparison with what happened to that young man. He didn't have to tell a lie. He didn't have any hidden things of dishonesty. He didn't have to have a righteousness or compromise. He didn't have to, you know, just spit out whatever deception came. You see, those who do that, they are backsliding and they don't know. 
They live in lie. They live in dishonesty. And they don't care. They don't understand uh, the worst thing that happens to you in life. It's not that problem. It's not that tribulation. And so it, Paul the Apostle says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. The people, because of their tribulation, they cannot interpret the word of God at face value anymore. They twist the word, they change the word, so that at least they'll not get into more trouble, it says, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, for which cause we faint not. All that happened to Paul the Apostle, the tribulation, the persecution. If anybody should have fainted, Paul should have fainted, beaten, stoned, left to die shipwrecked, betrayed by false brethren, imprisoned, and yet the search for which cause were faint not. But though our outward man perish tribulation, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, for our light affliction, Paul stoned till they thought he was dead. Our light affliction. False brethren came around, they smiled, they embraced him, and they got information from him and to use that to destroy him. And yet he said, it's a light affliction. They stoned him. They thought it was God before. But now because, you know, he, uh, they looked at him. No, he cannot be God. Don't exalt him too much. Don't praise him. If anything good has happened, if uh, that man at least tried to rose up and walk, don't, don't exalt him. Rather, stone him. They stoned him, light affliction. In the prison, Paul and Silas, in the midnight, they sank and they prayed and they praised the Lord. And the Lord opened the prison doors and all the chains and shackles, they were totally taken away. And the prisoner did not come to them and say, what shall we do to be saved? And I appreciate them. He called that our light affliction. They bound him with chains that add thorns. And Paul said all that is light affliction. How do you evaluate your own tribulation, your own trial? Heavy, great, unbearable. I never knew this would happen. Talk like the apostles in the Bible. That's why they're giving to us as examples for our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Verse 18, in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal for a short time. But the things which are not seen are eternal. The Lord grant us eyes to see well in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, escaping the great tribulation coming after the rapture. You will escape. We will escape in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 21. 
For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Verse 22. In verse 22, and except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Verse 23. Then, if any man shall say to, unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe ye it not. Verse 24. In verse 24, For there shall arise false Christ, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. The time of the great tribulation is not only the time of the wrath of the Antichrist, that the deception of the false prophets, that the manifestation of great power, supernatural power, at the time of that great tribulation. And even now, as the word of God says that this is time of the present tribulation, the people who are getting away from salvation, they're getting away from sanctification, and are running after signs and wonders. And they do not know the source of those signs and wonders wonders in our own church little church here the joy we had many years ago here at the headquarters if we were to have bible study on monday and somebody was there by the roadside doing some so-called signs and wonders and great great things that being said our people will keep on coming until they go to the Bible study. All those sensational things did not catch any of our people. And if in a particular community somebody raised up um, what they call signs and wonders, no salvation, no sanctification, no holiness, only signs and wonders, and the talk is all over town. Our people in those communities, they keep on coming until they got to the Bible. They knew that signs and wonders, if they are alone by themselves, without clear message of salvation, and without the clear lifestyle of sanctification, those signs and wonders amount to nothing. And that's the reason why the people of the members of Deeper Life in those days, members and workers and ministers, nothing could deceive them to go into you know, all those false assemblies. And I pray that same attitude will retain even till today in Jesus' name. It says, for then shall be, shall arise false cries and false prophets and shall show great signs. This Christ talking, this Christ talking. He didn't just say they'll show signs. He said, they will show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, you will not be deceived. In verse 25, it says, Behold, I have told you before. Point number two, escaping the great tribulation coming after the rapture. Look at three things here. Number one, the prophesied punishment and wrath from the Almighty. 
they were in the great tribulation. Number two, the perplexing plagues and wrath of the Antichrist. Number three, the predicted perdition and watchfulness on uh, and wrathfulness on adverses. Look at number one. Number one is the prophesied punishment and wrath from the Almighty. Deuteronomy chapter 4, reading from Versace, it says, When thou, Israel, art in tribulation, when it was still to be future, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. The great tribulation is coming. In the latter days, it says, If thou turn to the Lord thy God, thou and shalt be obedient unto his word. That will be the only condition those Israelites will be rescued, protected, preserved, saved during that great tribulation. Jeremiah chapter 30, reading from verse 6, ask ye now and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned unto paleness? Even women who are, you know, being with child, they don't want to go through that labor pain again not to talk of men that are not constituted created to bear such pain and it says at the time coming the time of the great tribulation that's what will come look at verse 7 in verse 7 alas for that day is great so that none is like it it is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but, she, but he shall be saved out of it. Amen. Amen. We're told in Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 15. Revelation 6, verse 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17. In verse 17, it says, For the great day of his wrath is come. Great tribulation time. It's a great period, not just one day, 24-hour day. The great day, the great period of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? That's what will happen at the time of the great tribulation. Look at number two here. Point number two is the perplexing plagues and wrath of the Antichrist. Perplexing plagues and the wrath of the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading here from verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 
chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. It says there will be a falling away first. Many churches that preached and believed and emphasized sound doctrine, salvation, righteousness, restitution, redemption, sanctification, holiness. Many of the churches that emphasized that in the past they are falling away from the truth. They don't preach that anymore. It's now entertainment. It's now attracting people to be multitudes in their churches. But standing for the truth that they are forsaking. That shows us the time is very near. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin, the Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he, as God, seated, in the temple of God, that's what he will do. Daniel tells us that in chapter 8, chapter, chapter 8, chapter 11, showing himself that he is God. Verse 5, remember ye not, when I, Paul the Apostle, was yet with you, I told you these things. Verse 6, in verse 6, and how? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Because the church is still here. That's why the Antichrist cannot come out openly and burst out everything he has as wrath for the world. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth, who now hinders, will let, will hinder, until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8, And then shall the wicked, the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it tells us, even whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. All those things uh, will be there. And they're there now in preparation for the coming of the Antichrist, lying signs, lying wonders, deceptive miracles, and so-called power. In verse 10, verse 10 says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, deceivableness in them that perish, unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 11. And for this cause, 
God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Verse 12, that they all might be damned. It's terrible to preach error. It's more terrible to believe that error. It's terrible to forsake the truth. It's more terrible to believe the lies, the deception, the false doctrine. It's terrible for somebody to come to you and tell you a lie, especially if you're a leader, if you control people, if you direct people, if you have some respect and honor, that people listen to you, and they listen to you because you are directing them in the truth. It's terrible when anybody close to you, near to you, will come and sell a lie like salesmen, and they sell the lie to you, and you accept that lie, believe that lie, and you use your belief in a lie to direct people and to ruin their lives. You see, the people that perpetrate the lies, they're working for the Antichrist. And the people that believe the lies, it says they will all be damned who believe, that, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The Lord keep us in the truth. Because the Lord lead us through in the truth in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three is the predicted perdition and wrathfulness on adversaries. Predicted perdition and the wrathfulness on all those people. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27. It says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fairy indignation, which shall consume and destroy and devour and burn up the adversaries. Look at verse 29. In verse 29, of how much sorrow punishment Suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy who has trodden under foot the Son of God and has, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Now comes that an unholy thing and has done despite to the spirit of grace. Verse 30 says, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. Don't take vengeance by yourself. Vengeance belongeth unto me. Don't pursue anyone with vengeance. Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31. It says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, evangelizing growing transgressors in communities within our reach. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we're reading here from verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men. Knowing the terror of the Lord at the present day, like on Sodom and Gomorrah, were persuade men. 
knowing the terror of the Lord that is coming at the time of the great tribulation we persuade men knowing the terror of the Lord that will come on the whole world at the great white throne judgment we persuade men knowing that therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men but were made manifest unto God and I trust also I made manifest in your consciences look at verse 20 in verse 20 now then we are ambassadors for Christ and though God did beseech you by us we pray you, we plead with you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. Evangelizing, growing transgressors in communities within our reach. Look at three things here. Number one, passionate preaching. Four, great transgression number two personal purity for a glorious translation number three purposeful preparation for a growing glowing transfiguration number one passionate preaching for a great transformation we're looking at Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 Daniel 12 verse 3 and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Those who turn men from sin to the Savior, they are wise. Those who turn people from salvation back to sin, the foolish and the fool will suffer. Those who denigrate, destroy, those who bury the sacrifice of Christ, the salvation of Christ, and they turn people away from salvation, and they turn them to sinfulness, they'll be among the foolish virgins. They'll perish forever and ever. But those who are wise, like the wise virgins, they are the people that turn transgressors to the Lord and their lives are transformed. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness who still remain on the preaching of sanctification. They remain on the preaching of transformation of life. They remain on the preaching on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Those are the wise people. They are the people who turn many to righteousness. They shine as stars forever and ever. I pray you'll be one of us. I said you'll be one of us. You turn lives to righteousness. Look at number two here. Number two, the personal purity for a glorious translation. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The proud, they have nothing to inherit except damnation, judgment, condemnation. The pompous, the people who puff up themselves, are the people 
who cannot be touched, transformed, corrected, cleansed up by the word of God, that you hide for the word of God to touch them. They'll perish, but the meek, the lowly, the humble, he giveth grace to the humble. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Look at verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The people who still retain their passion, their thirst, their hunger, they are saved, they are still hungry for more. They're sanctified, they're still hungry for more. The new creatures in Christ, they're still hungry for more. The work of regeneration, transformation, sanctification has been done in their hearts. They're still hungry for more. Blessed are they with the hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The impure in heart will only see Satan on a final day. Will only see the Antichrist on the final day. Will only see the false prophet, the impure in heart. Those who have iniquity in their heart, the Lord will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. But the people who have given up any interaction with iniquity, any interaction with transgression, any interaction with bad, dirty, defiling lifestyle, and they have turned to the Lord for the blood of the Lamb to cleanse them, wash them, purge them, purify them. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I pray you'll see God on that final day. Because that's what the rapture is all about. In Hebrews chapter 11, Reading there from verse 5, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God, or pleases God, the life of holiness. What pleases God, the life of righteousness. What pleases God, the uncompromising life in sanctification. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. What pleases God, the life of faith and faithfulness. Faithful, faithful to the word, faithful to the Lord, and faithful in the private, in the public. Faithful when you are all alone, faithful when you are with people. Those are the people that please God, and those are the people that will make it on the final day in the rapture. I pray you will be there. By faith, Enoch was translated rapture that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had raptured him, translated him. For before his translation, his rapture, before the flood that came, he had this testimony that he pleased God. We're looking at number three here. Number three, purposeful preparation for a glowing transfiguration. Purposeful preparation. May the Lord make every one of us ready in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 3. 
I'm reading from verse 17. Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. Great, great exhortation. If this man wasn't living a sanctified life in the public, he couldn't have told those brethren, be followers of me. If this man wasn't living a transparent, holy life in the private, he couldn't have been talking to the people that knew him in the private, Silas, who was in the prison with him. Timothy, son in the faith, very close and intimate with him. If those people that knew him privately, if they didn't see transparent sanctification and holiness, he couldn't have said, brethren, be ye followers of me. And if you're a pastor, if in your home you're not living a holy, righteous, pure, transparent life, this verse will be missing in your life. Brethren, be ye followers of me. If you're a father, you cannot tell your biological children if you burst out in anger, beat them. You burst out in anger, talk to their mother anyhow. This verse will be missing in your life. You couldn't tell your children, my children, be followers of me. You lose them. Dear mother, and those sons and daughters, they know you. And they know you intimately. They know the life you live. They know that, you know, to outsiders, you are like an angel, angelic mother. But to them, they know now, they know now, they know. And you couldn't tell them, my daughter, you can't do that. Your daughter will giggle, smile, mother. So you know that's bad. I'm doing, I got it from you. Now you are telling me you can't do that. This verse will be missing your life. And if this verse is missing your life, you know what? you might miss the rapture if you don't change. It says, brethren, children, members of the church, be ye followers of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. It calls on everyone. Everyone is a leader by, you know, in your own community. Even the leader of the house fellowship, the leader of a local assembly, the leader a region of Asia, the leader a state of Asia, the leader a national of Asia. Whether local or national, we're leaders. And we should so live transparently, so live Holy live, so live righteously that we can say, members, brethren, children, be ye followers of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, for our conversation, our conduct, our lifestyle is in heaven. From whence also ye look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for him. He's coming so that he can take us away in the rapture. And then after that, there'll be the great tribulation. Verse 21 says, in verse 21, we shall change 
a vile body. When that translation takes place and the dead, they rise, their dead body will come alive complete and full and perfect. And their spirit and soul that had been in heaven will join with their body and then they go with the Lord to be with the Lord forever and ever. And those of us who are still alive, this uh, body now, it will be transformed. Who shall change a vile body? This body now cannot go up independently because of the force of gravity. But at the day of the rapture, it says he'll change a vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. After he rose from the dead, he could enter into the closed room and without knocking at the door, without opening the door. And so he would just go in and say, peace be unto you. And at the time of the rapture, you see this ceiling will not hinder us. It, it will change our body. It will transform our body. It will become a glorified, transfigured body. And then we go. We'll not even know that the ceiling is there and we're gone. You'll be there. I said you'll be there. You'll be there in Jesus. You'll not need an aeroplane. You'll not need a jet. You'll not need anything. You just go. And uh, you have not thought about this. And whatever clothes you are wearing at the time of the rapture, something will happen. It will vanish away. And before you get over there, the clothing of heaven will have been upon you. I will be there. I will be there. And it says he'll do that. He'll do that. He fashion us according to his glorious body. By the way, I said now that, you know, the clothes, everything will be off. You know, the grave clothes that they, you know, bound Jesus with, everything remains there in the grave, in the empty tomb. And yet when Mary saw her, saw him and said, Thinking that was a gardener, if you have taken my Lord from here, tell me where you have taken him. He wasn't naked, he had the clothing of heaven. And Jesus said, Mary, oh, and she, she, my Lord, Rabbi. And then she said, Touch me not yet, go and tell my brethren. I'm going to the Father and your Father. I'm going to my God and your God. And then he came back in the evening. He had the clothing of heaven. You'll be beautiful beyond description in that clothing of heaven in Jesus' name. Who shall change a vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the walking whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We're expecting the rapture any moment from now. And thank God you'll be there. Will I be there? I, I, myself, will I be there? How about you? I said I about you. We'll be there. We'll not only be meeting, you know, every Saturday. We'll be together forever and ever with the Lord in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, we've learned about the present tribulation. Give me the strength and give me the grace and give me the everything it takes to endure and to overcome my own present tribulation. And Lord, prepare me, prepare me, prepare me, prepare me with your grace, prepare me with your strength, prepare me with everything it will take so that on that day of the rapture, I will be there, you'll be there. And then, after we've gone, there'll be great tribulation in this world. And I pray you'll not be on earth at the time of that great tribulation. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.
pray, you will not miss the rapture. But don't forget, there are things we have to endure here. If our Lord went through it, and the apostles went through it, we cannot run away from it. The present tribulation should not make us to forget about the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget the future tribulation should not be our focus. We are not appointed unto wrath. If we hold fast and manage the present one with grace, you will make it. What are you going through? What are you going through? There are many antichrists now. Don't forget. They can make things difficult for you. Don't lose focus. Don't lose focus. Men's heart may be failing them. Believers, hold fast to your faith. Hold fast to Jesus Christ. Our Father told us, add this one to your prayer list. That God will give you grace. To be able to bear what you have to bear now. And to escape the great future tribulation. Don't forget... Many people are paying for money. They are praying for various things. You have to pray. Don't forget, enduring the general tribulation that is common to the righteous. Believers, the Lord said, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good share. I've overcome the world. Don't forget. The tribulation of the righteous. We glory in tribulation also. This tribulation teaches us patience. That you are patient. We learn long suffering. It's not to destroy us. Because our God is with us. Remember, when you are passing through the fire, God is with you as a believer. There is nothing that you are, you are passing through now that should break you. Pray, God will help you. You will not be broken. Endure it. Enduring the tribulations of the righteous by faith. Whatever you are going through, always remember Jesus. Look at the example of the Lord Jesus. He was looking at the coronation ahead. What are you looking at? A little persecution? A little misunderstanding? You want to pack the Bible? You want to pack your faith aside? No. Look ahead. 
the glorious day is coming. The world can make you ashamed. They can ridicule you. Look at the example of our Lord. He went through it. You will go through it, but you will make it on the last day. Sinners can resist your preaching, but persist in preaching against their sin. Whatever the consequence, endure it. It is appointed to us, not only to uh, uh, joy with him, but also to suffer with him. The Lord will keep you. When you evaluate the tribulations, you will not faint. Why should you run away? If Jesus and his disciples went through it, you can't run away. When a minister faints, it's because he, has for, he will forget everything. Forget the ministry, forget their strength, forget the courage, forget everything. You will not faint. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. But I believe your strength, the strength of Israel, is the great one. And the Bible says, because we have this ministry, we faint not. Don't faint. Don't faint. The time of the great tribulation is coming. It will come upon the unregenerate. Backslider that refuse to repent. When the rapture takes place, they will suffer here on earth. It will not be your, own, it will not be your, your portion. Because already you will have been taken away. There will be punishment and wrath from the Almighty God against unrighteous people. It will be the time of Jacob's trouble. Rich men, big men, powerful men will be calling on rocks to fall on them. But believers, you'll be rejoicing with the Lord in the air. Don't forget. There will be perplexing plagues and wrath of the Antichrist against those who miss the rapture. Many churches pray, please pray for this church, pray for this ministry. We've read about so many churches. They started well, but today they have turned tail to the Bible. Ask the Lord to please help us. We will hold fast. We have been given this word of life. We will not let it go. We will hold on to it. Don't forget predicted perdition and wrathfulness on the adversaries. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. Finally, don't forget, passionate preaching. Because you know what is coming, endure it. Preach it, the gospel. Whatever the affliction now is temporal. Whatever you are going through now is temporal. It will soon be over. Pastors, it will soon be over. Brethren, it will soon be over. Endure it. Preach the gospel. In seasons and out of season. Make it, your, make it a habit. Make it your passion. And the grace of God will keep us true in Jesus' name. Don't forget, there are personalities that have gone before us. Enoch, because he pleased God, God took him. Here you are. Are you preparing for the growing transfiguration? Are you preparing? Prepare, it. Prepare very well, my brother. Sister, please endure. It will soon be over. And the grace of God will keep us to the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for this great message. Message of comfort. A message of warning. You have brought to us this night. We have heard your word. 
Father, I'm asking and praying that everyone here present today, your grace will keep us true in Jesus' name. Father, we pray whatever we need to endure at the present time. We know it's just temporary and it's a light affliction. Father, please give us grace to endure them in the name of Jesus Christ. And the heart to love you. The heart to keep holiness, to keep righteousness, to keep the truth, to keep preaching. I pray, Father, that you will grant unto every one of us in Jesus' name. And when life is over, you have given us a soothing, a soothing word of encouragement. Our, this vile body will be changed. Everything will change. Affliction will be no more. Ah, Father, we pray. Grant us the grace to know that time and to experience it in Jesus' name. I will thank you for our Father whom you have used. Lord, we ask you in your greatness, in your goodness, Lord, enrich him with more grace, with more wisdom, with more power for your service in Jesus' name. And when he sees us, he asks us, will he be there? We said, yes, he will be there. He now asks, are we going to be there? We said, we will be there. Father, we pray. His joy will be full, seeing every one of us there in heaven. Keep us there in Jesus' name. As you are holding him, you will hold us. As you are helping him, you will help us. Thank you because you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray.